quick, what's 8 times 27? Well, we can use the distributed property to break this down into a more simpler problem. So 27 is just 20 plus 7, and we can distribute the 8. So 8 times 2 is 16, put the 0 there, plus 56, and this is 216. You could have done the long multiplication way, where you do 27, and then an 8 here, that's 56, 16 plus 5 is 21, when we get the same answer. But the point I'm trying to make is that as long as we retain properties of equality, such as this right here, we can rearrange pieces of the problem and tease out certain parts, which will allow us to more easily reason about a solution. And this is the essence of algebra. So I brought this all up because we're going to be doing some Boolean algebra. And Boolean algebra has a lot of similar properties to regular algebra on numbers, but there are some few edge cases that you have to watch out for. So let's just run through them really quick. We have the commutative law, which just states that x times y is going to be equal to y times x, in which the order of the inputs do not matter. And it's the same with addition. So x times y, we can just substitute these for concrete numbers. So 3 times 2 is going to be equal to 2 times 3, right? No matter which order we put the inputs, it doesn't matter because we're going to end up with 6 in the end. And this is not true if we do the fusion of operations, right? If we, if we do x times y and then add z, it's going to result into a different number than if we did y plus z first and then multiplied by x. These two are just not equal. Next, we have the associative. So associative. And this just states that the order in which we group operations do not matter. So we do all multiplication, like x times y times z. There we go. So we do this first, y times z, and then multiplied by x. It doesn't matter if we do x times y and then multiplied by z, right? The order in which we group the operations doesn't matter. And it's pretty similar to the commutative. It just deals with grouping. And it's the same with addition. And next we have the distributed property, which just states that x times the grouping of y and z is the same as doing them individually and then adding them together. So x times the grouping of y plus z is equal to x times y plus x times z. And this is not the case for the second part, because the first part is multiplication over addition, and this is addition over multiplication. Regular algebra does not work with this. And I encourage you to plug in concrete numbers to verify this for yourself. But in Boolean algebra, this does work. So, yeah, this works fine in Boolean algebra. And this is the edge case, really. But moving on, we have the Morgan's Laws, which just states that we can distribute the knot and it will kind of flip all the operations. And it's kind of like the negative sign, but not really. So not of x and y is going to be the same as not x, not y. So we flipped the x's, and then we can flip, it flips the sign also. So and becomes or, and in the other case, or becomes and. So these are all equivalent. And finally, we can move on to simplification and seeing how this works in action. So here's a Boolean expression, and if we count the parts, quote unquote, uh, we're just going to count all the inputs and operations. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it roughly uses eight, quote unquote, parts, and we want to bring this number down. And we can do so by doing all the laws that we just did, right? Rewriting things so we can retain equivalence and then factor things out. So first, we can start with the Morgan's Law here. So we can distribute the not. And this is just going to be not x and not y. And bring down the rest of the equation. 
Now you can notice that we're doing all and operations here. So we can use the associated property, that is the order in which we group operations, does not matter, to do this part first. So let me just write that out. Not x and not x and not y. There we go. And this pretty much tells us that not x and not x. Well, if we plug in two inputs, two of the same inputs into an AND gate or an AND operation, it will just give us the same thing back. And you can think about this if you're confused. So this is just not x and not y. And then we still have this outer knot. We can use De Morgan's law again to distribute the knot. So not not x is just x, not not y is just y, and then we had to flip the and into an or, and we know that this entire Boolean expression behaves like an or operation, it behaves exactly like an or operation, and this just has one, two, three, three quote unquote parts. So we brought down the number of parts we used from eight to three. Another way you could have figured this out is that if you were given the truth table for this, you can just pattern match against the already existing popular Boolean operations and just say, oh, this behaves exactly like the OR, so we'll just use an OR. So if you guys are intimidated by all this, don't worry, because I actually never memorized any of this, nor did I really use any of this consciously while going through the course material, and I got through the course material just fine. And it's because we're using a simulator, which just means that finding the most optimal amount of logic gates to implement a truth table doesn't impact performance or cost. And of course, in real life, it does matter, right? Going from eight to three, it does matter. It will save you money and it will make things run more faster. But in our case, since we're using a simulator, it won't really affect the speed, nor are you guys buying any of these parts. So you're fine. But I encourage you guys to look through this and do them. If you find that you're actually having lots of fun doing these optimizations, reducing the initial Boolean expression to get a smaller one, don't let me stop you really. Like, I'm just lazy and I just wanted to get through the course material as fast as possible. And I'm not really that interested in optimizing hardware. So, yeah. But anywho, this is about the last sort of introduction lecture that I will give before I send you guys off to using the hardware simulator. And that's where all the fun starts, when you're solving all the puzzles and really having fun with interacting with the course material. And from here on, it's going to be more hands-on. So thanks for bearing through all of the theoretical stuff with me. It's not the funnest thing to watch sometimes. And yeah, thanks for watching and I will catch you in the next one.